All right, so we're a little bit after four, so we'll get started. Again, if you haven't already joined the Pear Deck, make sure you go to joinpd.com and enter the code that you see there on the screen, CJWUPM. Also, make sure you change your Zoom screen name to your school name, followed by your first name. And let's get this thing underway. So as usual with these sessions, I'm going to be jumping back and forth between uh, the Pear Deck screen and the Zoom screen. So if I tell you to go to the Zoom screen, make sure you pop over there. That way I can write on the screen and notate some things for you. In the Pear Deck screen, you write on the screen and do some things for me. So notice right now we're in the Pear Deck screen. Notice there's some directions up at the top. You've got a picture of meiosis. And the screen asks you to circle all of the haploid cells on the slide. So just uh, take a stab at that and see if you can circle the haploid cells on the slide. And if you don't know what that means, take a guess. But go ahead and circle on your screen all of the cells up there that you think are haploid. I see about 17 of you so far have answered. So again, if you're in, make sure that you um, circle the cells with the drawing tool on your screen that are haploid, any cell that's haploid. And if you don't know, that's okay, take a guess. If you just joined us, uh, go to joinpd.com and enter the code that you see in the upper right-hand side of the screen, CJWUPM. All right, I want to take a look at what you guys are circling. So it looks like most of you have the right general idea. So before we talk too much about haploid cells, Let's talk about meiosis and what it does. First of all, I want you to remember that meiosis is a type of nuclear division. Its job is to divide up the DNA in a cell, in a eukaryotic cell. Meiosis only happens in the reproductive organs, either the, the um, ovaries in a female or the testes in a male. And meiosis's main job is to take cells that are diploid, and I'm gonna go now to the um, the PowerPoint screen or what, what I'm calling the Zoom screen so I can write on the screen for you. So make sure you're looking at Zoom. So meiosis really has two main jobs. One of those, at least in humans, is to take cells that are what we call diploid. And notice the symbol for diploid is two times N, two times the number of chromosomes. Diploid cells have two of each kind of chromosome. So essentially humans have 23 kinds of chromosomes and we have two of each of those for a total of 46 chromosomes in each of our normal, what we call somatic cells, our body cells, not our reproductive cells. So meiosis job is to take a specialized diploid cell called the germ cell, these are cells, again, either in the ovaries of females or the testes of males, and divide those. And it turns out it divides them twice, like you see in our picture here. And the first thing it does is it takes the, the kinds of chromosomes, which remember in humans, there's 23 kinds of chromosomes, and we have two of each of those. So here we only see two kinds of chromosomes. We see this big chromosome, and then these small ones. So the red one in this first pair that I circled and the blue one, those together are called homologous chromosomes. Now they're in different colors because whoever cells these are, one of those chromosomes came from that person's father and one of them came from that person's mother. 
They're not called homologous because they're identical because they're not. They came from different people. They're called homologous because they have the same genes in the same order. Um, they may have different alleles. They may have different versions of those genes, but they control the same traits and those genes are in the same order. So we have 23 sets of homologous chromosomes. So what happens first in meiosis is that those homologous chromosomes line up into pairs. The like pairs line up across what we call the, um, in this case, the metaphase plate from their partner. Um, and that happens in metaphase of meiosis, what we call metaphase one. So in metaphase one, the homologous chromosomes line up across from their partner. They line up in pairs. After metaphase, if you guys think back to mitosis, next you get anaphase. And ana is about splitting. So in anaphase one, this set of chromosomes gets pulled to one cell, side of the cell, what we call one pole, and this side gets pulled to the other side or the other pole. So we end up with one of each kind of chromosome on each side of the cell. After anaphase, we get telophase. In telophase one, uh, a new nucleus is built around each of those sets of DNA. Um, the spindle apparatus is broken down and this cytokinesis begins. So after cytokinesis, this one cell has now split into two. This original cell was diploid. This one had four chromosomes, but if this was humans, there would be 46 in there. After meiosis one, we now have two cells. These cells are now haploid. Haploid, the symbol for haploid is N. And haploid literally means half the normal number of chromosomes. Uh, but really, I want you to think of haploid meaning having one of each kind of chromosomes. So again, in, in humans, we have 23 kinds of chromosomes. Haploid cells have one copy of each of those. So in humans, this wouldn't be N equals two, this would be N equals 23 if we were talking about a human cell. But notice that these chromosomes still are made out of two pieces. They're what we call bivalent chromosomes. They're made out of two chromatids a piece. That's not the way a normal chromosome ought to look. So each one of these two cells now goes through another set of, of division, what we call meiosis II. Meiosis II is essentially just like mitosis. Its job is to split this cell into two identical cells. So this one splits. These two are maybe not quite identical. We'll talk about why in a minute, but pretty close. These two are pretty much identical. So we end up from one germ cell, which is what we're talking about up here. We end up at the end of meiosis, both one and two, with four cells. Our original germ cell was diploid, 2N. And in humans, it would have 46 chromosomes. That would be its diploid number. The four cells that we get at the end are haploid. And in humans, again, that would be N equals 23. And these four cells develop into our gametes, our sex cells, sperm in men, eggs in women. So one of the jobs of meiosis is to, from haploid germ cells, to create, uh, I said that backwards, from diploid germ cells, create haploid gametes. So take a diploid germ cell and split it into haploid gametes. That's important because a haploid sperm and a haploid egg are gonna to get together to make a diploid zygote. So by for meiosis, splitting the chromosome number in half, it helps to maintain the, the number of chromosomes in an individual from generation to generation. Without that, the number of chromosomes would double every generation. So that's important. From diploid germ cells, create haploid gametes. The other important thing that meiosis does in its second function is to create genetic diversity. You guys have probably just 
finished studying evolution in class, hopefully. And you guys should know that genetic variability or genetic diversity is sort of the starting point for evolution. Without genetic variability, there can be no evolution. Meiosis creates a lot of that genetic variation. It does that in a couple of ways. In the very first stage of meiosis called prophase one, these homologous chromosomes, these pairs of chromosomes actually connect with their partner and they actually exchange some pieces. So they create new versions of chromosomes that never existed before. So you as an individual in your gametes, you have versions of chromosomes that you don't have in your other cells. So you end up passing on to your offspring because of crossing over, which is what happens in prophase one. You end up um, passing on to your offspring versions of chromosomes that you yourself don't have in your normal body cells. That's important. I want you to think of crossing over like a, a shuffling of the genetic card deck. And it's a, it's a foundation for creating genetic variation. Also in metaphase one, we get what's called independent assortment. So we talked about how in metaphase one, your chromosomes line up in pairs. So let's say this is chromosome number one right here and this is chromosome number two. Well, the chromosome number one that you got from dad might line up on this side and the one from moms might line up on that side. But it could be the other way around. Moms could line up over here and dads could line up over there. The same could happen for each pair of these chromosomes. Every time it's random which side which of these lines up on. And it turns out because of that, you can end up getting in humans two to the 23rd different alignments. Well, after they line up, they separate. So this set of chromosomes goes into one cell and this set goes into another. So every time they line up differently, you end up creating a different set of cells here at the end of meiosis one, which ends up giving you a different set of cells at the end of meiosis two. So prophase one, you get crossing over where homologous chromosomes swap gene segments and create new chromosomes that are passed on to the offspring. And an independent assortment happens in metaphase one and it's when the homologous chromosomes line up randomly across from their partner and end up getting split into different, um, different gametes ultimately, creating different versions of gametes every time. So again, meiosis is about two things, taking diploid germ cells and creating haploid gametes so that the chromosome number stays constant in individuals from generation to generation. And number two, creating genetic variability through prophase one and crossing over and through metaphase one and independent assortment. Important points about meiosis that you ought to know. All right, I'm gonna go back to Pear Deck now. This is just showing you crossing over. Um, the blue chromosome and the yellow chromosomes are homologous chromosomes or homologs. They're the same kind of chromosome, one from each different parent. They join together, and you can see on the right-hand side of the screen that they've swapped some gene segments. So now those chromosomes on the right are, are gonna be passed on to the offspring of this individual. And that, that offspring is gonna get a version of a chromosome that that individual doesn't even have in their normal cells. Really good source of creating genetic variation. Crossing over. All right, so now we have another question. So notice it says both mitosis and meiosis are forms of cell division that produce daughter cells um, containing genetic information from the parent. We've got two parts of the question here. We're gonna answer uh, A together, and then I'm gonna ask you to quickly answer B just by typing it out. Notice A says, describe two events that are common to mitosis and meiosis that ensure the resulting daughter cells inherit the appropriate number of chromosomes. I'm gonna to go to the scoring guy. Actually, let me see here for a second. Let's don't do that just yet. So let's think about some things that are the same about mitosis and meiosis. 
Who can tell me what happens immediately before mitosis or meiosis start? That's really important. What happens just before both of these processes start? Interphase. Okay, b b before either process though, before anaphase, before before either one of those. Is it transcription? Mm, you're, you're sort of close, not quite. What happens to the DNA before mitosis and meiosis? It replicates. It replicates, so it copies. Well, that's important because it's gonna split and you wanna make sure the offspring gets the right amount of DNA. So that's one thing you could talk about is that before both of these processes happen, the DNA is replicated, it's copied. Another thing that you could talk about is during metaphase, what happens to the chromosomes? What happens during metaphase? Help me out, somebody unmute. What's metaphase all about? Independent assortment. Okay, yeah, but independent assortment doesn't really happen in mitosis, though. What happens in metaphase in both mitosis and meiosis? The chromosomes line up. It's about lining up. Well, that's important because remember, what you're trying to do is separate them. And if they don't line up right, they're not going to be separated right. So it's crucial that they line up. So you can talk about, well, in metaphase, the chromosomes align so that they can be split properly. You could even talk about in prophase. What happens to the DNA during prophase that's pretty pretty important? Somebody help me out. What happens to the DNA during prophase? It uncoils so it's visible. All right, so you, you got one, you got two letters wrong in your answer there. It's not about uncoiling, it's about coiling. Uh, okay. So before cell division happens, the DNA is all uncoiled and unwound. And it would be, think of it like um, a spool of yarn thrown all over a room. But instead of having just one spool, you got 46 of them. It would be really hard to take those 46 spools of unwound yarn and separate it into two identical pieces. So before mitosis or in the first step of mitosis and meiosis prophase, that DNA winds up into like a not into nice spools. So it's much easier to separate. So you could say in prophase, DNA winds up so that it can be split more, more accurately, more evenly. Um, that's just a few of the things you could talk about. There are many others. You could talk about how cytokinesis happens at the end of both of these, and it splits the cell in two. Lots of other things you could talk about on part A. But I would like for you guys to go ahead and type in a quick answer to part, to part B. So take like two minutes and type in whatever you know, some differences essentially between mitosis and my. I'm getting some feedback from somebody's mic. Make sure you're make sure you're muted when you're not talking, Gus. So again, we still got somebody unmuted. Make sure you're muted if you're not uh, if you're not talking to the group. And go ahead and be typing in your answer to part B. I'm gonna see what some of you are saying. So again, notice we can't tell who who's, who who made these answers.
All right, so I want to pull up the, the scoring guidelines, what the folks who actually graded this question on an exam, uh, what they used to grade it. And I'm going to do that on the next slide. So here are some, some differences. So notice that, um, look down at part B, uh, where it says feature, number of divisions, number of resulting cells. So in mitosis, the cell divides once. That original cell divides one time, and you end up with two cells. In meiosis, there's two rounds of cell division. There's meiosis one and meiosis two. So that original cell essentially went through two divisions, and you end up with four cells. So that's a big difference. One division, two cells in mitosis, two divisions, you end up with four cells from the original in meiosis. Notice the next one, the ploidy of the daughter cells. This is about the number of chromosomes. In mitosis, you end up with your, your cells that you make, their ploidy is the same as that of the original cell, the parent cell. So if you start with a diploid cell, you end up with a diploid cell. If you start with a haploid cell, you end up with a haploid cell. In humans, mitosis is about taking diploid and making more diploids. Turns out in some other organisms, it may not work that way. But point being, your, your daughter cells, the cells you make, have the same number of chromosomes as the cell you started mitosis with. On the other hand, in meiosis, the offspring cells, the daughter cells, have half the number of chromosomes that the original cell had. So if you started with a 2N cell, a diploid cell, you end up with haploid cells. If you started with a tetraploid cell, which is what 4N means, you would end up with diploid cells. All right, let's talk about uh, the chromatids separating. So remember, the chromatids are those halves of the X-shaped chromosomes, the half of halves of the bivalent chromosomes. In mitosis, that occurs every time. That happens in anaphase of mitosis. On the other hand, in meiosis one, it's not about separating chromatids, it's about separating the whole homologous chromosomes from each other, the pairs. And then in mitosis, meiosis two, rather, the chromatids separate. So again, in meiosis, doesn't happen in meiosis one, does happen in meiosis two. Crossing over is another thing you could talk about. Doesn't happen in mitosis, does happen in meiosis, helps to create genetic variation. You could talk about the independent assortment or the separation of homologous chromosomes, does not happen in mitosis, does happen in meiosis. All right, so any questions here on this particular free response question? Or just general meiosis questions for that matter? Don't be afraid to ask if you have a question. All right, I'm gonna go to the next slide then. This next slide sort of separates the differences and similarities between mitosis and meiosis. So remember, it, mitosis on the left column, meiosis on the right. Mitosis, there's one division for the whole process. Meiosis, there's two divisions. So one cell becomes four in meiosis. In mitosis, one cell becomes two. In mitosis, the homologous chromosomes, they don't join together, which ultimately ends up causing crossing over. But in meiosis, they do. They synapse, they join, and they cross over, which is what number three talks about. Number four, um, the centromeres dividing is talking about the separation of those uh, chromatids. It happens in mitosis and anaphase. It doesn't happen in anaphase one in meiosis, but it does happen in anaphase two in meiosis. Item number five, in mitosis, the daughter cells have the same number of chromosomes as the original parent cell. And in meiosis, the daughter cells have half the number of chromosomes as the original parent cell. Number six, the daughter cells after mitosis are exactly genetically identical to the original parent cell and to each other. In meiosis, they are not genetically to each other or to the parent cell. Because remember, meiosis is about creating genetic variation. 
Mitosis's job is to uh, create more cells so that you can grow, to replace worn out old cells, just to, to replace cells that need to be replaced, or even to repair damages like cuts or tears or burns. Whereas meiosis's job is to create those sex cells, those um, sperm or egg, and also to, to make sure that they, they have genetic variation inside. So again, that's a quick summary of mitosis and meiosis. Anybody have questions or comments here for me? All right, so now we're gonna look at um, some Punnett square type stuff. So this is what we call a tri-hybrid cross, or this one actually is a quadra-hybrid cross, I guess. We're looking at four different um, sets of genes, four different sets of alleles, I guess I should say. Question A, how many different possible gametes can an individual with the following genotype produce? Before you try to answer that, I wanna go back to the PowerPoint screen for a minute and show you something. So you go back to your Zoom screen. So let's say we had an individual and we're looking at traits and that individual was um, heterozygous. So during meiosis, meiosis is going to separate these genes from each other. This E is gonna go into one cell and this little E is gonna go into another. And these are gonna become the gametes. Each gamete gets one of each allele. So it gets one E gene. Let's, let's say we had, um, let's say we had an individual that had these alleles and these alleles. So when meiosis happens, meiosis is gonna put one of the A genes, I should say one of the A alleles into each sperm or egg and one of the E alleles into each sperm or egg. They separate. So you're gonna get some, um, some gametes that have a little A and a big E. You're gonna get others that have a little A and a little E. And there really aren't any other possible combinations you could have here because each gamete has to have one of each allele, one A, one E in this case. So that's the kind of logic that you've got to use to think about part A. So I'd like for you guys to try to answer part A just by writing an answer on the screen and you can write it somewhere right in here on your Pear Deck screen. So, so go back to your Pear Deck screen and I'll go there with you and see what you can do uh, by writing an answer to part A on the screen. I'll give you about another minute to think about that one. I'm going to just take a look at what you're thinking. So I see 32, I see 16, I see 8, 16, 16, 64, 8, 8, 64, 12. So we're kind of all over the place as far as our answers go. Lots of 16s. Lots of eights. So let's go back to the PowerPoint screen with me now. And let's think about how this would work. 
So remember that each gamete is going to get one of each letter allele, one A, one B, one D, one E. So one possible combination would be big A, big B, big D, big E. That's one possible gamete. Another possible gamete would be big A, little b, little d, little e. Notice those two gametes are different from each other. Another one would be big A, um, big B, big D, little e. Another one would be big A, big B, little d, little e. All right, we could go big A. Let's see if we got any more big B combinations here. Just a second. All right, let's see. So we could also go big A, little b, big D, little a e. We could go big A, little b, big D, big E. And you can see we just keep, can keep generating more and more. So let's say that's one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, we could go big A, um, let's see, little b, just a second here, guys. Just a second, trying to do this in real time is tricky sometimes. So big A, big B, little D, little E, we got that one already. Uh, let's see, D, B. All right, I think that's all the big A ones, two, four, six. So we all, then could also have the little A ones. So we could have the same version of these little A ones. We could have little A, big B, big D, little E. We could have little A, little B, little D, little E. Little A, big B, big D, little E. Little A, big B, little D, little D. We could have here, whoops. Let's see if I can get this to work like so. All right, does anybody see a combination that I've missed? So point, point being, you've got to come up with every distinct combination. Now notice this next one, B is going to have fewer possible combinations because here's the deal. Um, these two are different from each other. These two alleles are. These two alleles are different from each other. But these are the same, and these are the same. So every cell is going to get one little b and one little e. We know that. They could get a big A and a big D. That's one possible combination. They could get a big A and a little d. They could get a little a, a little b, a little e, and a big d. Or they could get a little a, a little b, a little e, and a little d. There are only four possible combinations there. And that's because these two are the same and every cell gets one of those. That makes sense. Anybody have questions here for me? Is there a specific formula to find the quicker? How much possible? Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you'll bear with uh, so let, yeah, let's, so let's go here for a second. So let's say we had, this scenario and let's think about how many possibilities there would be with just this scenario with these three so we could get the big a 
the big B, the big C. That's one possibility. We could get the big A, the big B, and the little C. I'm gonna put a line under my little C's. We could get the big A, um, the little B, and the big C. And we could get the big A, the little B, and the little C. So that's everything with the big A. And then we could get um, the little A versions of those same things. So we could get this, and this, and this. And then we could get that one, and that one. And I think that's all of them. So let's think about a, a formula that we could use to do that. And the easiest way to do that is, is to think about each pair, how many possibilities are there? So there's two possibilities for each pair and we have three pairs. So turns out this is the easiest way to do it. How many possibilities with each pair raised to the number of pairs with that number of possibilities? So two possibilities, three pairs, two to the eighth, two to the third rather is eight. That makes sense. Yes, sir. All right. So actually, up here on A, we missed a couple. There should be should be should have been up here two to the fourth, right? And what's two to the fourth? Sixteen. Sixteen. So we should have had sixteen up on A. We just missed a couple there in real time. Uh, but really, what I see them doing more to you, maybe on the exam is something like you see there on question C. So look at question C with me. It says, what is the probability that the cross between the following genotypes, this one and this one, what's the probability that they'll produce an offspring with that genotype? So one way to work that problem is to draw out this big old humongous Punnett square. Well, I'm gonna tell you that's not the best way to do this. The best way to do it is think of it like a bunch of small Punnett squares. Let me make some space so that I can write here. So let's first of all, think of what are the odds that this set of A's right here and this set of A's right here give us that set of A's. And if you can't visualize this, you could draw small Punnett squares. So if we drew a small Punnett square for big A, little A, and big A, little A, we would get this. And we would see the chances that this set of A's and this set of A's making this set of A's is two out of four or one half. So I'm gonna write one half down below there. Now think about the B's. What are the chances that this set of B's and this set of B's give us this set of B's? Now again, once you've done this, you probably don't need to draw the Punnett square, you can do it in your head. But if you can't do it in your head, just quickly sketch out Punnett square. And again, I'm hoping that you see that the chances that these bees and these bees give us these bees is um, what, one, two out of four again, one out of two. So write that down. Now do the same thing with the Ds. What are the chances that these Ds and these Ds give us these Ds? And again, I'm hoping most of you can see that's one out of four. But if you can't, draw out that Punnett square. And you end up with this. And you see that there's one out of four, little d, little d. So write that down. And then finally, what are the chances that these E's and these E's give us these E's? And I'm hoping that you, you can see without drawing the Punnett square that it's one out of two. But if you can't, again, draw the Punnett square. So you end up with something like this. So you end up with two out of four big E little E's or one out of two. So what we're trying to find out here is what are the chances that all these cross with all these 
give us this genotype. And the way we do that is we multiply our individual probabilities for each set of alleles. So we take the one half times the one half times the one fourth times the one half. And let's see, that would be four times four, 16. So we would end up with one out of 32 is our probability here. And once you can start visualizing these individual crosses in your head, you can do this kind of problem much, much faster than trying to draw a huge Punnett square that could be 64 boxes or more. So one out of 32 would be the correct, correct answer here on part C. All right, so another thing that we want to look at today are pedigree charts. So I'm hoping that you guys know that a pedigree chart is a, is a diagram that essentially shows you how a, how a trait is passed through generations. And one thing that we can figure out from those pedigree charts are what are called the modes of inheritance. How is a trait, and those are how is a trait, um, how is the trait passed from generation to generation? There's some important terms to know when we're talking about modes of inheritance. One of them are autosomes. These are non-sex chromosomes. So it turns out, we, we said a minute ago, that humans have 46 chromosomes per cell. 44 of those are called autosomes. They don't have anything to do with gender. They could be identical in males and females. They contain genes for non-sex related things. So there's 44 autosomes per human, per, per diploid human cell. And then there's also two sex chromosomes. We know that in females, those are X and X. And then in males, they're X and Y. Now there are some, some things that can happen where someone could be XXY or XXX. Those are pretty rare. In general, female XX, male XY. Those chromosomes carry things related to gender. They can also carry some normal important genes. Like for example, genes that allow you to see colors are on the X chromosome. Um, the X chromosome, it turns out, has lots of important genes on it. The Y, not so much. The Y is a really small chromosome and it really has genes for male development, that is really it. Another important term we need to think about here is gene linkage. So if genes are linked, that means they're on the same chromosome. So think of a chromosome like a, um, a string of Legos where each Lego is a different gene. So each chromosome has lots of genes on them and they're all linked together on that chromosome. And typically when you inherit one of those, you inherit them all. They come as a set. Now there are some things like crossing over that can make that not happen. But think of linked genes being, being um, inherited together because they're hooked together physically by that chromosome. Another important term here is a carrier. So a carrier is an individual who has one copy of a recessive allele. But because they only have one copy of that allele and it's recessive, they don't express the trait. But because they have that copy, it turns out they can pass that on to their children, their offspring. And if the other parent also passes along a recessive allele, the individual could end up with that recessive trait. So we're gonna look at, um, today we're gonna look at five or six types of, of modes of inheritance. We're gonna talk about traits that are autosomal dominant. We're gonna talk about traits that are autosomal recessive. We're gonna talk about traits that are X-linked dominant and X-linked recessive. We're gonna talk about traits that are Y-linked. And we're gonna talk about traits whose genes are on the mitochondria, mitochondrial chromosome. Remember that your mitochondria have um, a little bacteria-like chromosome on them and they can actually pass on important traits. Most are related to like how you do cell respiration and such. All right, we'll go back to the pair deck screen in a minute, but let's just stay here for, for the time being. And let's look at some symbols that you see in pedigree charts. So a square is a male, circle is a female. Mating individuals are hooked together by a horizontal line that connects their centers, like so. 
And then children are hooked by a vertical line, this one. And then if there's more than one of them, they're hooked together by horizontal here. So these two are the parents and there's one sister and one brother. Now, if they happen to be twins, in this case, we would call these fraternal twins, meaning they're not identical. They're connected by like a triangle shaped branch, a Y shaped branch. That's just to let you know they're twins. And if they're identical twins or monozygotic is another way of saying that they have this, they have this triangle, but they're also connected together there in the middle. So those are identical twins. Now, if we're looking at a particular trait, individuals that, which are affected by that trait, have that trait, their shape is completely colored in. On the other hand, if we have individuals that are carriers for a trait, they only have one copy, they're of heterozygotes, they can, their shape can be half colored in. And another way to show that same thing, really these two are showing you the same thing, although in this case, here they're using this dot to show a sex link thing. A lot of times you'll see a dot just to show a carrier. So when you see a dot in the middle, I want you to think of it, I want you to think of these two being the same thing. Half shaded or a dot, they're carriers. If someone in the pedigree is dead, lots of times they'll be crawl, just a slash to let you know they're dead. Um, sometimes a triangle just means the baby miscarried. That's a spontaneous abortion. Um, this could mean um, essentially incest, that related individuals are, are mating and having, um, having babies. And then if for some reason, maybe we just don't know the history of the, the individual, we may not know that person's gender. So you might see a, a diamond shape just because we don't know, that we just don't have the records to know what sex that person is. So let's look at some pedigree charts. The first mode of inheritance we're gonna talk about are traits that are autosomal and dominant. So remember autosomal tells you that the, the trait that we're talking about, the genes for it are on a non-sex chromosome. One of those 44 non-sex chromosomes. And these, these are dominant, uh, this particular kind of trait is dominant, which means you really only have to have one allele. You have to have inherited it from one parent. So when we're looking at um, pedigree charts, males and females are equally likely to get these traits because they're carried on autosomes. They're not on the sex chromosomes. These traits don't skip generations. So if somebody in um, the parent generation has it, and nobody in the child generation gets it, that means that trait is out of that family for the time being because there are no carriers. If there's no carriers, it can't skip a generation. When an individual has the gene, they have the trait. It only takes one. This means fathers can pass it to sons, male to male transmission. There are certain kinds of traits that fathers can't pass to their sons, they cannot. Autosomal dominance, they can. There are several human conditions that are autosomal dominant and are passed on that way. One of them is Huntington's disease. This is like a neurological degeneration disease where your nervous system degenerates. Achondroplasia is the most common type of dwarfism. This is a fairly common, uh, really serious kind of kidney disease. And this familial hypercholesterolemia is a um, a genetic form of really high blood cholesterol that can lead to very early heart attacks and death. So all these traits are passed on by the autosomal dominant mode of inheritance. Now here's what a pedigree chart looks like for an autosomal dominant trait. So notice right here, this father has the trait, the mother does not. So these are generation one, individuals one is the father, individual two is the mother. Here's one of their children. Here's another child, another child, another child, and another child. So five children. Notice that out of those five, generation two, number one, number five, and number eight, they all have the trait. 
Number three here does not have the trait and neither does number six. So some of you might be thinking, well, who's this person number two right here? Well, person number two is a female and it's the mate for person one. Remember, they're connected by horizontal lines through their centers, they're, they're mates. So number four is the mate for number three. Five doesn't have one, neither does six, and eight is the mate for number seven. Uh, notice that in generation three, child one has it, child two doesn't. Um, the children of persons three and four from generation two, they have three children, none of them get it. Well, that makes sense because neither one of them have the trait. And then the children of seven and eight, let's move this around a little bit so I can see it better. So we have one male that gets it, one male that doesn't, one female that gets it and one who does not. Point being, what you should see in autosomal dominant pedigree charts, males can pass it to males, like here one passes it to one. Males can also pass it to females. Um, females can pass it to females. Females can pass it to males. And if somebody in generation one has it, more than likely somebody in two is going to get it and three is going to get it. It's not going to skip generation two and then show up again in three. It's not the way it works. So those are autosomal dominant pedigree charts. We're about out of time, so I'm gonna move on to autosomal recessive traits. So these are also carried on non-sex chromosomes, but these traits are recessive, which means for an individual to get it, they have to have two copies of the gene for that trait, which means they have to inherit it from both parents. Autosomal recessive traits are equally likely in males and females, because again, they're carried on non-sex chromosomes. These can skip generations because there can be carriers and carriers don't have any symptoms. They don't show the trait. Only individuals that are homozygous have the trait. You've got to have like a little a, little a. You've got to be homozygous recessive. If a parent has a trait, offspring that don't have the trait are going to be carriers. Because let's say that, let's say we have a parent who's little a, little a, we know that when meiosis happens, all their gametes, whether eggs or sperm, are gonna have one of those little A's. The baby's gonna get a little A. Now they might get a big A from the other parent and turn out little A, little A, but they're gonna at least be a carrier. There's several versions of these traits that are um, found in humans. Um, Tay-Sachs disease is a, um, another degenerative uh, nervous system disease that's found in um, certain groups usually of people with Jewish ancestry. PKU is a very similar disease. It's a, this one's about um, um, you can't digest a certain protein, a certain amino acid, and it causes nervous system issues. Um, and then you got cystic fibrosis, which also affects the nervous system. So here we're looking at an autosomal recessive pedigree chart. Notice males can carry it, females can carry it. So down here, we end up eventually with two people who are carriers. They have children. This male and this female are the first two affected individuals in this whole pedigree chart. These two don't have any symptoms. These two don't have any symptoms of the trait. They don't show it because it's a recessive allele. These two have the trait, whatever it is, and they have the symptoms of that trait. So individuals to have these traits they must have inherited the gene for the trait from both parents. All right, so we're going to end today by talking quickly about sex-linked uh, sex -linked traits and mitochondrial traits. So if a trait is sex-linked, that means the genes for it are on either the X chromosome or the Y. So instead of calling them sex-linked traits, sometimes we may call them X-linked recessive traits genes that are on the X chromosome. We could talk about X-linked dominant traits, 
dominant genes, dominant alleles found on the X chromosome, or we could talk about genes that are found on the Y chromosome, Y-linked. Now it turns out X-linked traits affect the sexes differently. Because remember, females are X, X. So a female could carry a recessive X, um, X trait. A male though only has the one X chromosome. So whatever's on that X, doesn't matter if it's dominant or recessive, the male is going to um, have symptoms of that trait. He's going to express that allele. So let's talk quickly about X-linked dominant traits. With these traits, turns out females are actually more likely to get these because they can inherit them from either parent. Because remember, they have two X's. The trait is present whenever you have one copy of the gene because it's dominant. Notice there is no male-to-male -male transmission because males are males because they got a Y sex chromosome from their father, not an X. So men don't pass these on to their sons. There are some um, rare exceptions to that rule, but in general, men don't pass this on to their sons. A female who has the trait may or may not pass the, the gene on to their children. A lot of times we show these genes as uh, superscripts on the X chromosome. So let's say this is, the, this is the allele for the trait. This is the allele for not having the trait. The children are equally likely to get this X chromosome or that one. It's a 50-50 shot, and that applies to both males and females. On the other hand, if a male has an X-linked dominant trait, like this guy, all of his females are going to get that X which means all of his female children are going to have that trait. On the other hand, none of his male children are gonna have the trait because his male children inherit the Y chromosome from their father. Now I'm not sure what just happened there. Let's see if I can get back to where I'm supposed to be. So there are several human genetic conditions that are transmitted through this X-linked dominant mode of inheritance. Hypertrichosis is sometimes called the Wolfman syndrome. So where people get the, like a coat of hair that's all over their body, essentially. Porphyria is a um, rare blood disorder. Um, a lot of people think that George III, who was king of England during the American Revolution, might have had this. Rett syndrome is another fairly rare disease that you don't hear a lot about. Here's a pedigree for an X-linked dominant trait. Notice we have a female with it. And that, that female passes it on to a daughter and a son. Notice the son passes it on to daughter and daughter. So all of his daughters, but none of his sons. Because remember, those sons, they get a Y from dad. The females get the X from dad. And since his X is affected, they all get it. Notice for this female right here, she has... Um, a male child that ends up inheriting it and a female child because females give X chromosomes to both sexes. All right, let's end uh, this discussion talking about quickly about X-linked recessive traits. These are far more common in men than in women. And that's because number one, they're recessive and guys, we only have one X chromosome. So really, it doesn't matter if it's a dominant or recessive trait. Whatever's on that X, we get it. These traits are recessive, so they can skip generations. And it turns out for a man to get these traits, he has to inherit it from his mother. Because remember, men get their only X chromosome from their mother. Females, they're going to have to inherit the trait from both parents. So they're going to have to have a father with the trait and a mother who's at least a carrier for them to show it. Once again, there's no male-to-male -male transmission. Fathers can't cannot pass these on to their sons because fathers pass a Y, not an X. And there are several common human genetic disorders that are passed on through this mode of inheritance. The most common type of blood or uh, color blindness, rather, red-green color blindness is an X-linked recessive trait. Hemophilia, it's where your blood doesn't clot normally. And the most common type of muscular dystrophy, where your uh, muscles degenerate over time. That's also an X-linked recessive trait. Let's look quickly at a pedigree chart for an X-linked recessive pedigree. 
So here we have a, a man who's affected by the trait. And notice that he has children, lots of children. Notice that none of his sons have it. And none of his sons are carriers because they're getting the why from father. But notice that all of the daughters are carriers. They're heterozygotes because they got one affected X from dad and one non-affected X from mom. And notice that these carrier females then can pass it on to both sexes of children. In this case, let's look at this one right here. She passes the allele on to a daughter who's just a carrier because she doesn't inherit the allele from the father, but she passes it to a son who becomes affected by this trait. So you see in this pedigree, there are one, two, three, four, five, six males that are affected. And there are no females that are affected. I'm sorry, there's one. There's one female that's affected. There's lots of females that are carriers, but they don't show any symptoms. All right, I wanna talk about one more thing before we uh, run out of time. And that is mitochondrial inheritance. So remember that the mitochondria have a small circular chromosome, very much like bacterial chromosomes. And that has some important genes on it that are really important to your health. It turns out that mitochondrial DNA is inherited through the egg, which means all your mitochondrial DNA comes from your mom. You don't inherit mitochondrial traits from your father. That's important. And here's what a pedigree chart looks like for a mitochondrial trait. Notice the mother has the trait, the father does not. And notice that every child of that mother gets that trait because there's only one of them. There's one mitochondrial chromosome. Every child gets it. Notice for this guy right here, he's got it, but notice that none of his children get it because you inherit your mitochondrial chromosomes from your mother. So those children got their mitochondrial chromosome from there, unaffected. Notice this female, she's got the trait and notice that every one of her children, regardless of sex, inherit that trait because they inherited all their mitochondrial DNA from her and it was affected. Once again, here we have an affected male and notice that none of his children get it. Um, because they don't inherit mitochondrial DNA from the father. This female, all of her children get it because all of them got that mitochondrial chromosome. There's only one of them, so there's no carriers, there's no dominant or recessive. Either you have the trait or you don't. So the mother passes that, that trait on to all her children. The father passes it on to none of their children. All right, we're really out of time for today. So what we'll do next time, and this, this will end up being week after next, because next week we have our normal uh, A-plus college ready study session week. So we will not have this session next week. But the following week, I'll take some pedigrees that aren't labeled, and we'll start with that. And you guys will have to figure out what the mode of inheritance is by looking at a pedigree chart. And that's always on the AP exam. And I'll be here to walk you through that. And then after we finish that, the next topic for week after next will be Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And we'll do some math with uh, evolution math, essentially, with Hardy-Weinberg e equilibrium. So I know we were kind of rushed today. I tried to cover a lot of material, um, and I didn't get through nearly as much as I hoped. But I hope it helped. And again, we'll finish this up um, two weeks from today, same time. Um, I hope this helped.